praise be Jesus and Mary. This first Sunday of Lent, we kind of see what's going on in the readings in general. How we have the first Adam in the first reading from the book of Genesis, who is tempted by the devil and disobeys God's law. And then in today's gospel, we have the new Adam, Jesus Christ, who is tempted as well by the devil, but instead he obeys the will of the Father. St. Paul speaks about this in the second reading from his letter to the Romans. For just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, through, so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Okay, so we have this contrast between the first Adam and his disobedience under the temptations of the devil and the new Adam, Jesus Christ, and his obedience to the will of the Father, notwithstanding the temptations of the devil. And now this same scene will also be played out in every individual's life. Okay, all of us must deal with temptation, demonic temptations, and we all have the choice to make okay, whether to follow the path of the first Adam and be disobedient or to follow the path of the new Adam, Jesus Christ, to be followers of Christ in obedience to the will of the Father, even if that requires self-renunciation, sacrifice, suffering, and even death. So let's go a bit deeper into the readings. Again, from the book of Genesis, the Lord God formed man out of the clay of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. And so man became a living being. Do you see all we have to owe to God Almighty? that he has given us everything. He has brought us into being and has given us life. And this applies not only to Adam, but to each and every one of us. At the moment of your individual conception, God created your soul out of nothing and infused it into your body. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and placed there the man whom he had formed, the garden of Eden, paradise. You see, God has given us every good thing. All good things come from God. And so because of this, we have certain duties toward God, okay, the duty to worship him, to love him above all things. This is the first commandment. And this is what our Lord is getting at in today's gospel. The Lord your God shall you worship and him alone shall you serve. Why? Because God is God. He is our origin and our end. He has given us all things. And because of this, it is our duty toward God to love him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. It is our obligation to worship the Lord our God, as we do here at Holy Mass, first and foremost at Holy Mass on Sundays and days, holy days of obligation. Adoring God, praying to him, offering him the worship that belongs to him in the holy sacrifice of the mass, fulfilling the promises and vows made to him are all acts of the virtue of religion, which fall under obedience to the first commandment. And this is from the catechism. So the devil, for his part, because he is a rebel and wants to draw us after his rebellion against God, we have a battle, a war to wage against him and the fallen angels. Again, from the Catechism, 
Scripture witnesses to the disastrous influence of the one Jesus calls a murderer from the beginning, he who brings death because of his envy that we were in the state of grace, destined for glory, destined for heaven. So through the envy of the devil, he becomes a murderer, bringing death into the world, who would even try to divert our Lord from the mission received from his Father. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Death, disobedience. In its consequences, the gravest of these works was the mendacious seduction that led man to disobey God. Remember that lie. He is a liar and the father of lies. Look at the devil in today's first reading. You certainly will not die. That's a lie. Adam and Eve did die, first spiritually and then physically. So the devil is a liar, and we should never give heed to his deceptions, no matter how alluring they may be. But we must always, in faith, be obedient to the will of God. And so how do we become victorious in this battle against the devil and his lies? Again, from the Catechism, such a battle and such a victory become possible only through prayer and vigilance. Remember the words of our Lord, watch and pray that you do not fall into temptation. So all of these examples that we have before us of those who have fallen from grace, sometimes big falls, people we know or have heard about and read about in the news. Why is that? We can say with certainty there was a lack of watchfulness, a lack of prayer. It is by his prayer that our Lord vanquishes the tempter, both at the outset of his public mission, that's today's gospel, and in the ultimate struggle of his agony. In the petition to our Heavenly Father, when we pray the Our Father and say, lead us not into temptation, our Lord unites us to his battle and his agony. Again, we should be attentive when we're praying the Our Father and lead us not into temptation. We're asking to be freed, to be victorious in times of temptation. Our Lord urges us to vigilance of the heart in communion with his own vigilance. Remember our Lord in the agony of the garden. He is watching and he is praying. And what are the apostles doing? They're sleeping. So we need to be awake, watchful, and prayerful. Vigilance is custody of the heart keeping our heart as an enclosed garden, like the Immaculate Heart of Mary, not allowing the seductions of the world, the false maxims of the world, to enter into our hearts, but keeping them pure and holy, like Our Lady's heart. The Holy Spirit constantly seeks to awaken us, to keep watch. Finally, this petition takes on all its dramatic meaning in relation to the last temptation of our earthly battle. What's our last temptation in our earthly battle? The temptation to despair of salvation. It asks for final perseverance. This is the last grace that we need to save our souls. Final perseverance until the end, until we breathe our last. Now what if during the course of our lives, because of human weakness, our lack of vigilance, our lack of prayer, we stumble, we fall from grace? We should not despair. There is always the mercy of God waiting for us and that can be found in the sacrament of reconciliation, the sacrament of penance. 
And this is what the responsorial psalm is all about. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness. So if there is a fall, that's not the end. Thanks be to God, because God is merciful. And so we ask for mercy, we repent, we convert, we firmly resolve never to sin again, and we go and we receive God's mercy in absolution from the priest, receiving absolution from the priest. Now we notice that in the psalm it says, for I acknowledge my offense. This is necessary to receive God's mercy. We must acknowledge our offense. And we see how this is becoming more and more difficult for Christians today. That's why lines in confession are so short, if they even exist at all. The times that priests allot for confession, okay, the need for confession is becoming almost non-existent. Why? Because a lack of the sense of sin, a lack of acknowledgement of sins, and this is not something new. Blessed John Paul II in 1984 wrote a, an exhortation, post-synodal exhortation. That is, he gathered with the bishops to discuss what were the major issues in the world. And one of them dealt with reconciliation and penance, this document. And he talks about the loss of the sense of sin. This is 1984, and we haven't improved. If anything, we've gotten worse. What does that mean? It means this document, which if it happened to have been embraced by the Christian world, would have resolved so many problems. I encourage all of you to go and read it. In any case, we'll read just a part of it explaining why there is this loss of the sense of sin. What blessed John Paul II calls a deadening, an eclipse of conscience. There are causes. The first one he talks about is secularism. Right? He says, secularism is by nature and definition a movement of ideas and behavior which advocates a humanism totally without God. And don't think that that's referring to non-Christians. No, it's referring to Christians who live practically like atheists. Okay? Practical atheism. Living a humanism totally without God, completely centered upon the cult of action and production and caught up in the heady enthusiasm of consumerism and pleasure seeking, unconcerned with the danger of losing one's soul. Blessed John Paul II, 1984. Has any, have any of us ever heard these words before? Why not? What happened? Did it fall on deaf ears? Was it not promulgated? The enthusiasm of consumerism and pleasure seeking. This secularism cannot but undermine the sense of sin. At the very most, sin will be reduced to what offends man. Right? And that's what we hear sometimes. Well, my sin didn't hurt anybody. We both consented. Well, what's the problem with that? The problem is that we forget that sin is first and foremost an offense against Almighty God. But Blessed John Paul II is saying the secularism, a humanism totally without God, is going to undermine the sense of sin or at the very least reduce sin to simply an offense against your fellow man. And that is how many people regard sin today, just in as much as it has offended their fellow man. And that's why judgmentalism you know, and all of the rest, all of those things which refer to our neighbor are mentioned. 
How about missing Mass on Sunday? Oh, that didn't hurt anybody. Oh, it offended God. But it is precisely here that we are faced with the bitter experience which I already alluded to in my first encyclical. Okay? See the Holy Father just repeating himself. We can't get it through our heads. Namely, that man can build a world without God. We can certainly do that. But this world will end by turning against him. We'll dig our own pit. And that's what we've done here in 2014. In fact, so this was 20 years ago. Am I doing my math right? No, 30 years ago. In fact, God is the origin and the supreme end of man. And man carries in himself a divine seed. Hence, it is the reality of God that reveals and illustrates the mystery of man. It is therefore vain to hope that there will take root a sense of sin against man and against human values if there is no sense of offense against God, namely, the true sense of sin, an offense against God. First reason, secularism. Second reason, errors in evaluating certain findings of human sciences psychology, modern psychology. Another reason for the disappearance of the sense of sin in contemporary society is to be found in the errors made in evaluating certain findings of the human sciences. Thus, on the basis of certain affirmations of psychology, concern to avoid creating feelings of guilt or to place limits on freedom leads to a refusal ever to admit any shortcoming. Does that sound familiar? Modern psychology, all caught up with just bringing interior peace to the person, even if it completely disregards truth. We're just concerned with eliminating your feelings of guilt and not restricting your freedom, because that might, you might find that disturbing. Through an undue extrapolation of the criteria of the science of sociology, it finally happens, as I have already said, okay, he's saying that again, he's already said it, that all failings are blamed upon society and the individual is declared innocent of them. We've seen that on the news, haven't we? Again, a certain cultural anthropology so emphasizes the undeniable environmental and historical conditioning and influences which act upon man. Okay, we don't deny these influences, but it reduces his responsibility to the point of not acknowledging his ability to perform truly human acts, that is, with intelligence and free will, and therefore his ability to sin. It's not his fault. All right? If that's the way we think, then there's going to be no sense of sin. The conscience is going to be deadened and eclipsed. Third, there is also the denial that there exist intrinsically evil acts regardless of circumstances. Contraception, abortion, intrinsically evil, always, everywhere. Fourth, even in the field of the thought and life of the church, Certain trends inevitably favor the decline of the sense of sin. Okay, now he's talking about trends within the church herself. And what are the trends within, within the church herself which cause a loss of the sense of sin? This is what he says. For example, some are inclined to replace exaggerated attitudes of the past with other exaggerations. From seeing sin everywhere, okay, from seeing sin everywhere, we now pass to not recognizing it anywhere. 
from too much emphasis on the fear of eternal punishment, they pass to preaching a love of God that excludes any punishment deserved by sins. Okay, these are two extremes that we need to avoid. We need to have a balanced view. But we need to recognize what extreme is present in the life of the church, in the trend of the church, and how that is causing a lack of the sense of sin. And in 1984, Blessed John Paul II is saying that we are not recognizing sin anywhere and that we are preaching a love of God that excludes any punishment deserved by sin. Right on the money. From severity in trying to correct erroneous consciences, they pass to a kind of respect for conscience which excludes the duty of telling the truth. So when your pastor tells you, just follow your conscience, wrong, that contributes to a loss of the sense of sin. So we need to regain that in our lives, in the church, in order to humble ourselves, to recognize where we have disobeyed the laws of Almighty God, to put ourselves on the path of the new Adam, Jesus Christ, and to be able to say with our Lord, get away, Satan, it is written, the Lord your God shall you worship, and him alone shall you serve. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.